It is my pleasure at this time to now introduce our first speaker, Dr. John Burke, President, or, excuse me, Principal Director of Quantum Sciences at the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Burke. Good morning, you all. Well, we're going to have a little bit of fun today with quantum science. So uh, my job in, in the uh, Undersecretary's office is to develop a strategy for quantum science. And uh, uh, you're, you're fortunate in that we had just completed that in the last year. So I'm going to show you some highlights and talk about some of the innovation uh, opportunities that you might be interested in. Now, let's see if this actually goes forward. Oh, I see. It's not going forward here. OK, well, that's fine. Uh, so quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics gets a bad reputation, I think, for being complicated and confusing and mysterious. Uh, but that's not true. So I get, I'm going to explain to you quantum mechanics in just one slide, and it'll be all you need to know. <clears throat> so first, Quantum mechanics has been around for a while, 100 years or more, uh, and technologically, it's already made huge impacts. So on the left here, I'm showing you sort of, sort of quantum basics. So uh, at first, right, you can take most things in nature, as it turns out, if you look close enough, but certain things are easier, like electrons or photons. You can look at those and, and see that they're quantized, that their existence in nature is discrete and where it can, where it can be. So in this case, I'm showing you something about energy, momentum, it's different variables where this quantization shows up, but uh, it's almost always there. So you can pick a couple of these states and make a discriminator. So you can, you can reliably change uh, the states between my, my plenty of labels here of zero and one, look a little bit like bits, we'll talk about that, uh, and uh, make this discriminator, and now you've made a very basic quantum sensor in the terminology of the industry. So these are already in use. Magnetic resonance imaging is a great example. Uh, probably saved many lives. Uh, GPS. GPS is predicated on something called an atomic clock, which also uses as a technique. It's been around for decades and has already made a huge impact. So it's worth remembering that as we go through some of the more exotic and interesting things that uh, we might see in the, in the near or even distant future. So in the middle column, this is sort of the nearest term uh, uh, set of technology. So it turns out that uh, these uh, states, zero and one, uh, they're not truly uh, unique in that they can only be in those two, those two potential uh, places, but you can make linear combinations of those two states. So in that way, you can, uh, you can put an analog number, a dimension to it. Now you've heard about wave particle duality maybe, so it turns out particles are also waves. Waves have phases, so there's a phase you can assign to a quantum state as well. So now I've taken my quantum object, which might be an electron or something more complicated, maybe even you someday in the distant future, and you can assign two numbers to it. So this is kind of interesting. Now I've taken a kind of a simple thing, and I've put a lot of information into it, these two analog numbers. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you could utilize this even fancier quantum sensors, better discriminators, and some of those are being developed now and will be available in maybe five years, maybe even less. When people talk about uh, quantum, they are often excited about the last one, though, and you've probably heard about this, uh, quantum entanglement. So entanglement's very confusing and complicated sounding, but for the purposes, I think, of everyone here, you should just think of it like multi-particle superposition. So now, I can take more than one, say, electron, uh, and I can, even though that each, each one of those can be in a superposition and hold two numbers, I can now put the combination of the particles into a combination of all of their collective states. So by doing that, I can put, store an enormous amount of information in these quantum objects in a small collection of them. It scales exponentially like the number of particles, four to the n here. Compare that to classical information and just zeros and ones, and I can store, say, an exponential number of digits of a single number, or maybe I could split up into several numbers, but that's a dramatic amount more information in quantum particles than you can, in quantum bits, than you can store in classical uh, bits. But 
The thing, and if you get nothing else out of this, the, the big caveat on the, on the right is what you need to be remembering. So I don't just get, don't get, don't just get to have all that huge amount of information. I have to reduce it to classical information that I can then use. So all the technology, all the applications have to live with this pretty severe constraint that I have to reduce this big exponential space to a small space. So I have to construct my problem very specifically to give me a simple answer, potentially from a very complex set of information. This is gonna be the problem that comes up again and again. So maybe we can use this entanglement it hasn't been really utilized yet in any, any practical application, but maybe in 10 years. We'll get to some of the timelines, although I'll warn you in advance. Uh, in, as a quantum mechanic, we have to live with uncertainty, and I, I'm not gonna have a concrete ex, uh, 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 prediction for you towards the end. Okay, let's talk about the innovation area. So there's a lot to do and still in fundamental science. Even though we've been at this for 100 years, there's still plenty we don't understand. New types of quantum objects to explore and understand how to control new materials. Quantum computer science is its own special new uh, area of science over the last few decades uh, that has a lot of, of fundamental research to do. Now we're gonna return to the technology side of this uh, uh, on the right uh, for a lot of the talks. That's probably where most people are most excited is in actually developing technology. But it's probably worth pointing out, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about quantum engineering. This is an, an emerging area of engineering. There are uh, centers at universities and even departments that are coming together to, to form what is known as a quantum engineer. The curriculum or definition of that is a little bit to be determined and what the scope of that is. But I'll tell you that there are a lot of specialized components that we need to, to leverage in order to actually realize any of the things in the, in the technology space not to mention in how to integrate those technologies and the architectures about how to use them. So in terms of innovation, in terms of patents, in terms of uh, you know, actually starting businesses, I think you'll actually see in the quantum engineering space is where most of the action actually is, yet little of the uh, public, uh, I think, perception is focusing on this space. So with that, I'm gonna spend a slide talking about some of the, some of the examples of this. So, uh, on the left here is a series of components, a bunch of different emerging areas all of their own. So these are, there are lasers, so-called single photon sources, which are very specialized sorts of lasers. But even the basic, the quote unquote basic lasers that we need are radically different than you might buy off the shelf from a, say a telecom company. Uh, we also need specialty photonics that is unlike anything that's it's mature today, special high band gap uh, materials and nonlinear non materials. We need weird vacuum components. Uh, I'm showing you a little tiny vapor cell is made basically based on a MEMS process. And we need a bunch of low temperature electronics, analog electronics, low temperature CMOS, everything in between. So we need all those components, none of which really are mature. So there's plenty to do just in developing the individual components. But then, of course, we want to make something real. We need to integrate them together. So if you look at my kind of cartoon in the middle, uh, you know, it's missing all the interconnections between the different cartoon layers, right? It's from, and you can imagine this being pretty difficult because some of that was going to be at very low temperature. Some of it's producing a lot of heat, maybe save some CMOS. There's going to be optical, optical components of this and photonics. There's going to be uh, potentially a vacuum that has to, this all has to live inside of, which, by the way, makes get, dealing with heat pretty difficult sometimes. So there's a lot to do in actually just integrating all of these things. So on the right, there's an example I want to show you here. Now, you're going, we're going to talk about quantum computing and all that, that, that uh, uh, a dizzying array of, of, of challenges later. So this is easy relative to, to that. So that is a room full of lasers on the top right image there, making the world's most, uh, most accurate atomic clock. Something like a, a, the age of the universe would have to transpire before you'd lose a second. But it also fills a room. Uh, so it's not very practical. And actually, the whole uh, statement I said of, oh, it can last a billion years, well, that's not true. It can barely last a week before it breaks. And you, know, you need an army of graduate students to kind of keep it going. 
So in the bottom right, this is a, a, a drawing from a, uh, an old DARPA program that I used to manage. Uh, uh, that where you can see all the little components and a little inch scale version of this, and that might be far off in the future, but actually a lot of those components have already kind of been created at sort of the proof of concept level. So that kind of integration is possible for a similar amount of performance, uh, even if it will take some effort and time to get there. Okay, so enough about components and minutia there. You're probably more interested in actually where the, where the, the technology is actually going. So, I've got sort of three areas here. Uh, on the left, navigation and timing. From the, from the military point of view, and even from uh, maybe in, in the civilian world too, eventually, this is probably where the biggest impact's gonna be in the shortest period of time, only in a few years. And you could argue because of GPS, it's already happening now, but we're talking about sort of the next generation of quantum using these superposition and, and wave particle duality kind of concepts. So GPS is great, but you might, un might realize that GPS is fragile in, in many situations, doesn't even work underground or underwater. So uh, there's plenty of opportunities in the DOD to build alternatives to GPS for navigation and timing. In the middle is sort of an emerging area that you probably haven't heard of. Uh, so it turns out you can make certain kinds of quantum sensors and imaging devices that can detect electromagnetic fields in an analogous way to like an antenna or an aperture like in your phone or a camera. Now, these are very immature, so we don't really know uh, how this will go, and they're kind of complicated for the time being, but the rules are completely different when trying to detect electromagnetic fields with quantum technology as opposed to antennas. So all of the infrastructure we've built along wireless could be disrupted if quantum can have a, a play here. In particular, things like agility, you don't think of quantum sensors as being particularly agile, but in this case, they actually are. You can make sensors that work over the entire spectrum. So there could be a, a, a big disruption there, not also in imaging. All right. And we gotta finally talk about computing. I'll say, so, so computing is, is a, a very exciting and there's huge amounts of money going into it. Something like two billion a year in the US in the private markets just this last year to give you a sense of scale. And so why is that? Well, here's this sort of list. It's already beginning to make an impact on science, uh, and I'll talk about the cybersecurity issues uh, uh, coming up in a bit. Uh, but sort of at a high level, uh, quantum computers are hoped to develop things like new materials, new chemistry, uh, and new medicines, all of which would have huge markets. Uh, there's a, a lot of claims that they could be used to op optional, uh, op optimize real-time logistics, could be important for everyone from aircraft, air carriers to UPS and, and parcel services to in the military. There's a lot of logistics involved in actually running a, a, a theater, especially in, during combat. Anyone paying attention to the Ukraine-Russia situation might have an inkling of how that might go and how important that could be. There's also a lot going on in, in thinking about using quantum computers for artificial intelligence. AI has captured our imagination right now but it's also very possible that quantum-enabled AI could be even better still. Uh, now, I'm gonna point out that all these things I just told you are pretty speculative. They're extrapolations from some core science ideas. So the odds of any of this working out is kinda low, any particular idea. But I'll tell you that the odds of all of that not working out, no one of these, I think, high-impact scenarios working is also pretty low. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. We don't really know where the impact's gonna be, but it seems to be that the consensus is that some disruptive impact is gonna come sooner or later. Uh, I've, I've got a little uh, mark on there of something like greater than or approximately 10 years. Again, uh, lots of disagreements on when this might emerge. If you have a crystal ball that can predict the future, please let me know, but uh, you know, probably some time away. Okay. so. Here's probably the, one of the more important charts I want to kind of spend some time on. So this is a map of all of the sort of core technology areas the, from the military point of view. Now, it's certainly reasonable that a um, civilian or other kind of uh, uh, commercial outfit might have a completely different set of opinions about this, so just keep that in mind. So I, I'm highlighting uh, on the vertical axis the potential military impact. So there's a little bit of opinion built into this, just to be clear. 
Uh, and on the right, on the, on the horizontal axis going to the right, there are uh, sort of a sense of the maturity, right? So in military speak, this might be something like technology readiness levels. Now, personally, I hate technology readiness levels with a passion. So we kept this a little bit to the point here of which actual uh, sort of capability has been established. So is there a real performance advantage that you can point to in a laboratory somewhere? Has there been a prototype with some practical utility that you can look at and say, yeah, that's practical? Have you fielded or operationalized this? Now, if you look here, uh, there's two different colors kind of showing you two different kinds of scenarios, and it's kind of worth pointing this out. So the green sort of circles, and by the way, the circle size is some indication of the uncertainty. If you get a bunch of quantum people in a room and get them arguing, hopefully they're, they're, the consensus is somewhere in that circle, but there's going to be just some disagreements, so they're trying to capture that. On the green, these are sort of devices that need to fit somewhere, right? So these kind of things have a pretty serious challenge later on because they had to have size, weight, power constraints uh, in order to actually go somewhere. And in the military point of view, I need them to survive huge temperature ranges and be able to hit them with a hammer and have a soldier drop it on the ground and not break. So we have a pretty severe set of challenges there. On the purple set, these are sort of system level devices. They might not be, need to be mobile. The hard part in these is actually even showing utility at all. It's worth pointing this out, though, because it looks like the purple boxes or circles are off to the left are much less mature, and that's true. But it's worth pointing out because the road to operationalizing or, or making these things uh, uh, useful in a, in a sort of an economic way or a military operational way is going to be different. Uh, they're going to spend more time at different points in this chart. Okay. So on the green, there's a whole selection of things in that sort of far right group, uh, things like atomic clocks, next generation atomic clocks to replace the ones in GPS, actually put in systems, maybe in base stations for future generations of, of wireless. Uh, there are lots of these electromagnetic sensors kind of peppered through there. I'll point out the ones in the, in the far right are the ones that we're probably most focused on actually getting to operational uh, capabilities soonest. And some of these are the ones that use superposition and, and this dual uh, uh, wave particle duality. Now, I'm going to talk about the ones on the left for a bit. So, uh, yes, quantum computing uh, is, is very exciting. Um, when people talk about it, they're really thinking about the bubble on the top left. That is large, error-corrected quantum computers, right? These are pretty well understood from a, from a theoretical point of view and what advantages they may have, especially for things like uh, uh, cracking codes, which is a whole other uh, problem we'll get into. Um, it's not clear we can actually make them, so there's a little sliver just off to the left of the chart because there's still a chance that it all might just fall apart. We discover some new rule in quantum mechanics we didn't know existed, or maybe it's just way too expensive to make one of these things actually uh, economic. So there's still some systematic risk here. But it's already having a huge impact, right? So right now, uh, President Biden, uh, last, about this time last year, signed a national security memorandum that says, we're all going to change our entire national infrastructure in cryptography for public key encryption away from what we're using today to a so-called post-quantum crypto, just because the quantum computer might show up in something like 10 years. So even if we don't ever get one, it will make a huge impact anyways. Now today, we have these small, noisy uh, quantum computers here in the, in the sort of lower middle. Uh, so uh, those haven't really found a performance advantage. Now there's some very specific toy kind of problems that people have found that demonstrate some uh, advantage over classical computers, uh, but these are pretty uh, tailored to, to, to highlight quantum computers' potential. They're a long way from actually showing a, a, a durable advantage. Now, one of the bubble I want to talk about is uh, secure communication and key distribution. There's a lot of uh, excitement about this. But of course, uh, if you go look at the, Na the National uh, Security Agency's website, they have a public, uh, basically, uh, statement about quantum key distribution saying, we're not going to do it. We've just been directed by the president to switch over to post-quantum crypto, and we're not doing quantum key distribution. I don't have time to go into the rabbit's hole of why, but uh, it's basically, it's sort of not complete enough, and it still has a num number of holes in it to actually use and really depend on. 
And it's not just the US government that has said this. If you go look at other allied countries, they have also looked at this independently and come up with similar statements. So right now, the, the actual impact of that seems to be pretty low, even though you could go buy a QKD terminal right now if you wanted. Finally, I gotta talk about sort of the area in the bottom left. Not every idea is good. So there are a couple of ideas down here that I wanna kinda highlight. Uh, I'll just briefly mention this long baseline interferometer uh, in, in the middle there. Uh, that actually could work, uh, but the, this, the amount of technology you would need to, to realize that is so difficult if at the time being that it's going to hang out there until technology dramatically improves, and then maybe we'll revisit that. Quantum radar, on the other hand, this idea that we can make some kind of a quantum-based radar system that can detect stealth planes and things like this, it turns out that that's rubbish, and that if you go look at it, uh, it the probability of making the, the amount of quantum resources you would need to do that, plus actually uh, return some signal, pales in comparison to what you would, could do classically. So um, we're not going to be following that very far. And finally, I have to, to pick on this thing called the quantum internet, which is an especially abused term. It kind of brings together some notion that we're going to have something analog of today's internet, uh, but using quantum mechanics somehow, and it's going to be great. Uh, well, it turns out that that's probably not true, and that probably people are really referring to quantum key distribution by a different name, because QKD has been kind of uh, uh, drugged through the trenches, so to speak, as I was just saying. So I think you should be very careful about uh, uh, in any articles you read about so-called quantum internet, that is just not gonna work out the same. And if you're interested in knowing some more details, come talk to me later. Okay, so that's sort of a space of all the technologies we're kind of paying attention to. Now, uh, everyone here cares about patents, so I thought I'd better have a chart about all the patents that, uh, that the, the US, and in this case, China, uh, have been invested in. Now, I just went on a whole tirade about quantum communications, but China has invested heavily in that. So that's an interesting little observation, that there's a big disagreement between sort of the West and the East on, on, this, uh, on this particular topic. I think we're right, but uh, it's, a, it's an interesting observation nonetheless. You can also see this huge swing in patents, especially on the US uh, uh, side, but starting to flatten out a little bit. There's been a huge surge of money going into quantum, a huge amount of interest, and you can see that here in computing especially. I have to talk about workforce for a, a, a moment. Uh, we, we need more of it, for sure. <laughs> um, so we went through the trouble of tracking down every DOD quantum person. We were pretty liberal with that, exactly that meant. Uh, and you can see there's about 200 people, including contractors, working with inside the, the Department of Defense on quantum. Uh, but they're trying to manage something like 250 projects, so we're spread pretty thin. So the, to the degree that uh, anyone can help and uh, encourage people to come into the field, I think we'd all agree generally in STEM, this is not a, a specific quantum issue really, it's a STEM problem. Uh, well, that would be terrific. Okay, so a couple of examples. So here's some quantum sensors in, in different applications. So on the right column, uh, I've mentioned navigation a couple of times. So one sort of new idea that is, is gaining momentum is that you could actually create a quantum sensor to detect, in this case, magnetic fields or gravitational fields. And it turns out you can make a map of all the little subtle variations in Earth's crust, magnetically or gravitationally, from denser or more ferrous materials, and make a map in here that actually are. These are maps that exist. And you can fly around or sail around and compare your sensor to the map, just like any other map matching activity, and know where you are. And this is extremely robust because you're, you're tracking huge signals from the Earth's crust that are not movable in any human time scale. Maybe if it's a large earthquake, you might have to go remap a little. But uh, uh, very robust and a very attractive uh, uh, way of navigating without having to use radio navigation or any kind of signals. Uh, on the left, same idea, but now trying to locally find an anomaly. So on the top left, I'll, I'll look at the magnetic a version of this. So for a long time, the Navy's been using this to detect submarines or trying to detect, detect submarines using their magnetic signature. But also, you can make sort of an upgraded MRI, something called an MEG, or magnetoencephalography, using these quantum sensors. So you see a person there wearing a 3D printed hat with a bunch of quantum sensors uh, sticking out of it in, in black. And those can actually detect in real time the neural signals in your brain. 
uh, and map them to a certain degree of resolution, and you can actually watch the brain function in real time and, and try to understand it. Now, it turns out neuroscientists have a lot of work to do in understanding how the brain works, so the actual utility of this is probably gonna be scientific for quite a while, but there's a lot of hope for using this to detect things like traumatic brain injuries, which could be useful for everything from soldiers, which is how the DOD got invested in this, to football players that, or soccer players that get a concussion. Finally, I'll point in the bottom left these uh, gravitational anomalies so you can find tunnels or underground infrastructure. That's very useful. And in the UK right now, they're investing in this to find old infrastructure in London. Uh, and that's kind of interesting application all on its own. I mentioned electromagnetic field sensors. So there's a, a collection of these here. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but uh, magnetometers are kind of a version of this, kind of an older version. These so-called Rydberg RF receivers are the newest version of this. You can see a picture of one in the upper picture. It's a, a little glass tube with atom ga or a gas of atoms in it and lasers that go through it. And you can imprint the electromagnetic field the, that you might wanna receive onto the laser and then detect it that way. Note there's no conductive material in that system at the way it's presented there. So that could, that's one of the reasons the rules totally change for using this as opposed to an antenna-based system. Running this is kind of complicated, so that you can see a kind of a prototype there in the bottom middle uh, as a whole sort of dormitory or fridge a little bigger than that of, of electronics to run, and, and to run this thing. So some work to do to make this practical, but interesting nonetheless because it's so programmable. It's basically, you could think of this as a software-defined antenna, which would be tremendously valuable down the road. You can also do this kind of thing with superconductors. There's a, something called a, a squid array, or superconducting quantum interference device. Uh, this has been around for a little while and, and offers somewhat complementary uh, capability. And it's also a little complicated in the fact that you have to have a superconducting and therefore low temperature system to use. So lasers are, are cold as, uh, or cold temperatures to work with, challenges either way, um, but a, potential, a lot of potential in using these kinds of systems down the road. I wanna mention some of these imaging techniques. Now, the one example where you can kinda of say that entanglement's being used in practice is in the middle and from LIGO, the Light Interferometer for Gravitational, the Gravitational Observatory. So they're using so-called squeezed light to get a few dB of improvement uh, over uh, the classical techniques they used to be using. But it turns out there's a whole bunch of ideas in this space, uh, everything from microscopy to some weird uh, interfer interferometrics, so-called nonlinear interferometers, um, even very, very long baseline interferometers, sort of like the Event Horizon Telescope, if you're familiar with that, but in the optical. So there's lots of ideas in this space, and I'd look for this space to be more prevalent as the time goes forward. Okay, quantum sensors. Now we're gonna get in a little bit into quantum computing, which I think a lot of people are interested in. So I just want to highlight again, there's sort of two approaches. There's these large machines, which are mostly imagined and being designed right now, they don't actually exist, and these sort of near-term, near intermediate-scale uh, quantum computers in the, in, the, in the bottom. There's a few variants of that even. Some of those have just worked, gone past the point of being able to be uh, unsimulatable by classical computers. That is, the quantum computer couldn't be simulated by a classical computer because of the complexity and the amount of information in there. I already mentioned a lot of these applications are kind of on the right, but there's a giant gap between what computers are capable of today and those applications as we understand it. Now the good news is there's a whole lot of people looking in the application side trying to find an application that doesn't have this problem, it's something you can do now. At the end of the day, companies are trying to make these things, they wanna make money now uh, to fuel this whole enterprise. Um, but uh, for the moment, there's still this big gap. Now, why is that? I mentioned this big caveat at the beginning, that you have to construct a problem so that you get a simple answer relative to the, the huge computational space that you're trying to explore. So on the far left, we have things we know, know that work. So I already mentioned sensors, but uh, you can make random number generators. I, I take a huge bunch of numbers. I don't even care what number I get as long as it's random, and I get one number back. That's pretty simple, and that works. Uh, using it as a tool for science in general, it's, 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 you can use quantum computers and the, the fact that you can't simulate them to explore and find out what's possible in computation beyond what classical computers could even get you. That's kind of true now, too. Uh, 
In the middle, high, things that have a high certainty of advantage. I'm not saying they're definitely gonna work, but definitely there's higher certainty of advantage than the things on the right I'll get to in a second. So factoring. So in this case, ideally, I put one number in and I expect to get two numbers out. Very simple input-output, very large computational space of possibilities that my quantum computer can sort through. Huge implications, though, right? If you could make a quantum computer that did this, you could break basically every public key encryption, which includes most of the devices, the internet, everything we kind of know and love today. So huge national security impact if that were to happen which is why President Biden signed the memo I, I uh, mentioned earlier. There's an area where I would call it, where is a natural overlap. I'm trying to map a quantum problem onto a quantum computer, and the mapping of those two seems to be relatively straightforward. In the end, maybe I want to get one number out, like a particular material property. Um, so that that's also kind of ma matches my constraint of having a simple output. There's a large number of problems in that space. Everything from new catalysts for fuels, new batteries, uh, new medicines, new, uh, in, in the case of the DOD, one of the things we're looking at is anti-corrosion. How can we save a lot of money by putting coatings on, say, naval ships or, air, or airplanes to make them last longer? On the right are as a selection of things that also might work out, but the, the certainty is a little bit lower. So things where I need to optimize a large set of numbers. Now I'm gonna put a large amount of information in my quantum computer, and maybe I only want one answer out, but I'm still putting in a lot of information, which kind of strains my constraints. I also might have to run this several times in order to get the right answer, which kind of makes it more difficult. Machine learning's got the same kind of problem. I'm gonna put a large amount, of information, large amount of information into my quantum computer, which is challenging. And the bottom right, I think, is the hardest of all something in the neighborhood of differential equations or, or uh, 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 linear algebra. So in that case, I'm putting a large amount of information in and probably I want a large amount of information out too. So we know that doesn't work generally, but there are some specific problems, sparse matrices and things like this where maybe there's an advantage, but again, uh, difficult to say for right now. It's probably also worth pointing out that these are all alg algorithmic sorts of ideas. In, this, in the realm of heuristics, there's a bunch of other ideas and we can't predict what those are. Some genius person might discover something and all of a sudden the world changes because of the leveraging something about the quantum computer we don't really understand. Okay, so how long is it gonna take? Uh, I get this question all the time and I don't have an answer for you. Probably at least 10 years. It could be 70 or more years. This could be, a, a, you know, and I think anyone that tells you otherwise anywhere in between that space is probably you know, optimistic or pessimistic and being a little bit too uh, deterministic in how they're thinking about it. You can see here um, in the solid circles, all of the um, uh, things to, the, all the quantum computers up to about 2021, 2022, and the open circles are the roadmaps from a few of the companies. And if you extrapolate those, you say, well, it's possible we have something in the opt optimistic scenario by like 2030. That's right around the corner on the scale of things. Um, I think if I, the solid line sort of, frankly, my best guess, just extrapolating through some of the claims, uh, going back to some of the, some of the points to, of today, that gets you to something more like in the mid, uh, late, late 2030s, 2040 maybe. Uh, and finally, if you look at just the actual progress to date, now again, the biggest money hasn't really been realized and practiced yet, so it could get, uh, it should, it, it, it should, um, increase in, in, in speed, but if you just take those, those, those numbers, you extrapolate them out, that goes to like 2070. So let's talk about this number, this threshold here. That's a factory number for a large 2048-bit uh, number from a, from a paper from uh, the authors recited there. Um, something like we need millions of qubits, it would seem to do anything useful, at least for factoring, and play a few other ideas too. And the reason is that, Quantum computers, uh, the qubits in them, are pretty noisy and difficult to work with. So you need something like a thousand physical qubits to make one logical qubit that you could actually um, use real, in a uh, reliable way. And I should say 10 to the seven, you know, 10 million qubits is sort of what we're looking at for factoring maybe, but some of the estimates for chemistry problems go up to like 10 to the 11, so another three or four orders of magnitude. So it was, uh, the huge scale of uh, when these things might work out. 
And let's talk about some of the challenges. Okay, so uh, there's a, going from, say, an order 100 qubits where you are today to tens of millions of qubits in the distant future. You can look through all the problems we have to solve. Everything from a new fan out strategy, we can't just have a whole bunch of wires going to a chip, that's never going to scale. 3D integration strategy, I kind of mentioned that at, the, that at the beginning. We don't know how to do that, these are sort of concept level things. If you go look at yield for these qubits, it's already not looking so great. So you're, if you want to scale up to huge numbers of qubits, we're going to have to tackle yield. That might be hard to do by just bulldozering it. You might have to, to resort to some kind of chiplet strategy like we're doing today in, in microelectronics. But that implies the, um, the, that, that back plane for these chiplets. What is that for a quantum information system? We don't know. So that's a whole area of, of, of effort. And finally, probably these computers are going to be very big, fill up rooms, like a high-performance computer, which means we need something like Ethernet cable or networking to actually stitch them all together and modularize them. We don't know how to do that either. So there's big problems to solve in, in, in trying to figure that out. And then it forgets sort of more traditional problems like how do you fab all of this, how much power does it need, how much money is it going to take, and so on. Okay, so uh, speaking of networking, a lot of people are interested in networking. I've already complained about the quantum internet as not being a real thing, but uh, networking for scaling of quantum computers is critical. So I just pointed out a couple of versions of this. However, the, the, the node length of this network can be kind of small to the size of like the a high performance computer, maybe a warehouse, 100 meters or so for would be a kind of a large length to have to kind of push from one quantum processor to another. There's a bunch of other ideas, though, from distributing your quantum computer over a big geographic range. That probably doesn't make sense because you've got to pay the penalty of energy and the speed of light in order to do that. Secure communications I've already talked about. Long base interferometer I've already talked about. Radar and internet I've already talked about. All of those are sort of these large network node lengths. There are a few ideas that haven't been really sorted through yet. We don't know how those are going to work, but they don't need to have long node lengths. So the point of all of this is that quantum networking is really important. There's a lot of fundamental research to do, a lot of engineering to do, but we can comfortably, I think, for the moment, uh, focus on sort of short-term laboratory scale network sizes, not very large ones. So be cautious if you start hearing people talk about building quantum networks across the country, or even across cities. Okay, so I'm getting to the end, uh, and I kind of want to highlight a, a, a few things. Um, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities, therefore, uh, for innovation. All kinds of new sensor technologies and components we need to, 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 uh, to develop and, and integrate. Um, lots of different packaging techniques have to be developed that don't exist today. Um, and I already mentioned this networking area as being another area of, of ripe for lots of um, uh, uh, of innovation. There are also a lot of non-technical challenges. I mentioned workforce. You know, so I want to mention supply chain. We have to develop all these components. To date, really, quantum technology has been built on the components from other industries, say telecom, or um, one, one famous example is a lot of uh, uh, systems use so-called rubidium atoms. Uh, and the reason they did that is because they could use the CD players from, if you remember your CD player, uh, the little Vixel is a Vixel laser in there that ran CDs. No one cares about CDs now. But that one Vixel enabled a huge surge in quantum technology at the, at the time. Uh, so we, kind of do, we need to develop our own supply chain just for this, just for quantum computers. And that's going to be hard. We're not going to have the economics of some other industry to, to ride upon. Uh, you know, there's a lot of need for business case analysis. I just mentioned a bunch of ideas. Some of them won't work. Some of them won't work because the business case won't really make sense. Or if it does, it's going to be DOD only. We're going to have to really power through in order to realize whatever that is. I think a lot more effort needs to go into looking at these business cases and really understanding what the economics really are. I mentioned the national security challenges also. Uh, this is creating a very complicated situation where we have on the one hand, quantum computing companies running off to develop the next generation of computer to maybe save us all with new medicines or save the planet with new you know, global warming uh, strategies to remove carbon from the atmosphere. That's all kind of possibly true. At the same time, the computer might, develop, might build a, uh, a, a factoring machine that could be used by someone with ill intent to break a lot of our, of our current encryption. So that's a very complex national security space to work in. 
Okay, well, with that, I'll, I'll stop, and uh, uh, thank you for your attention. And, and also, thanks to the organizers for, uh, for uh, inviting me here. Thanks. Oh, awesome.